Hi everybody, it's Russ and my Hammers 11. I hope you're all safe and well. YouTube channel, please hit that button, that subscribe button and that notification button so you're made aware of any time we put new content on. Uh, lots of great guests, lots of great ex-players, including today. You recognise him. He played, I think, over 54 times appearances for the club, six goals across a six-month, six-year period. Not six months, that'd be impressive. Six-season period. Um, he's obviously now Deputy Chief Executive of the PFA and a couple of weeks ago was um, elected onto the Wafer Board of Disciplinary Ethics and Control. It's Bobby Barnes. Hi, Bobby. How you doing, man? Good morning, Russ. Nice to meet you. Yeah, how are you? How, I imagine you're living your life on Zoom at the moment. Uh, yeah, very much so. I think it's very fast at the moment because, uh, you know, a lot of the committees and things that I'm involved with uh, involve uh, overseas travel. And uh, at the moment, that's all on ice. So um, I'm spending five or six hours a day on Zoom at the moment. So I think uh, without, without Zoom, Teams and all the other uh, platforms I think I'd be lost but fortunately uh, in this age of technology we can all still turn touch. yeah it's crazy because you imagine this was like 20 years ago <laughs> well yeah I mean to be fair I think it would have been just about mobile phones wouldn't it so yeah. you know probably great big mobile phones and so uh, yeah this has been I mean it's been a godsend I mean in, in so many different ways I mean in terms of you know different organizations uh, certainly in terms of my staff and my London office pretty much everybody now is working away from the offices. I don't think we've actually had the offices open for about mm. three months now. So uh, fortunately, we were prepared and we had everybody had the right hardware, had the right software. So, you know, been able to run things in exactly the same way. Yeah, no, exactly. I could imagine 20 years ago, no one would have Netflix, never heard of Netflix. We'd have Snake, <laughs> wouldn't we, in our 3310s. We'd be very good at Tetris by the end of it, that's for sure. <laughs> but anyway, um, th thanks for doing this, Bobby. Obviously, the whole idea is we interview um, players and, and, and fans mainly, but players nicely to interview about their time at West Ham, their memories. So hopefully it's, not, it's, it's probably the, the nicest Zoom call you probably have because it's not about... <laughs> Well, hopefully, Russ, I'll fit into both of those categories exactly. because, uh, you know, obviously I was fortunate enough to play for the club, but I've always, you know, obviously a lifelong supporter as well. And uh, for me, obviously, you know, one of the great highlights of my career was the fact of being able to represent the club that I supported since I was a young boy. Yeah, exactly. So, so why, was, why was West Ham your club, Bobby? Why was it your club? Why did you support them? Well, I was brought up in the East End of London. I was brought up in Leightonstone and... Uh, even even as a youngster, obviously West Ham was the local team. You had Lake, you had West Ham, and you had Lake Orient. And back in back in those days, um, when you were able to get to a ground, you'd go to alternate. You'd go on alternate weeks, so yeah, you'd go too. to West Ham one week, and you go to Lake Orient the other week. And yeah. uh, it's uh, it's quite funny actually because I um, Lake Orient was a lot easier to sneak into than Upton Park <laughs> back in the day. And uh, I was talking to Barry Hearn a little a little while ago, and we were talking about me sneaking in the ground, and Barry being Barry. Said, well, that's how he was trying to calculate how much gate money I owe him. So, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> but, but yeah, I think yeah, I, I'm I'm very much a believer that you you know even as a youngster you you, you support your local team, don't you? I mean, it, it's always been quite slightly frustrating when you see local kids walking around in Manchester United shirts or Liverpool shirts. But I think I'm, I'm pleased to say that you know in this part of London, I think you know pretty much everybody I meet. Um, you know, around this part of, of London and indeed in Essex, is pretty much a Hammers fan. We get the odd, uh, we get the odd mistaken identity people with the Spurs lot, but in the main, it's uh, you know, it's West Ham very much. Exactly, and we've been social distancing for years, Bobby. You know, we just do the <laughs> comedy wines. That's it, and and then that's it. There's no handshake. There's no hug. Comedy wines. You know, that's it. <laughs> if you've been doing it, we're we're ahead of the curve in terms of that, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always been difficult actually because. Uh, 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 for many years, I lived in the same road as Harry Kane and um, Danny Rose. So uh, obviously, as a, an ardent West Ham fan, you have to be polite, of course. Yeah. But you know, it's ne never easy, particularly on derby days. No, exactly. And obviously, with the PFA position, even more so, being sort of as neutral as you possibly can. <laughs> well, to be honest, it's one thing I've never been. I think I've always, I've always been quite uh, overt in the fact that you know I'm a West Ham fan. Yeah. I'm not neutral. I'm neutral in pretty much every other game, but when they play against West Ham, yeah. I'm not neutral. Oh, fair enough. I don't think I don't think, I think you could be, Bobby. You know, if it's ingrained in such an early age, I just don't think you can be. To be honest, <laughs> I couldn't be. It's like when you have to go to. You know, when I sit in you know, the press boxes or whatever for away games, it's really hard. It's really hard. I'm not used to it. But, um, well, but yeah, I'm sorry. It's funny, actually, Russ, because when, when I go to Chelsea, um, yeah. I often go to Chelsea and uh, when, I watch, when I watch Bruce Buck, is always warning me to be on best behaviour, as it were. And it was quite difficult, actually, particularly because I think the last time when we went up there and we actually won, 
uh, surprisingly, we actually won, and I'm sitting there sort of like this, sort of <laughs> trying try to be polite to my guest, yeah, you know, to my host, but at the same time, you you, def, you definitely just wanted to cheer as loud yeah. as you can. Yeah, I know it's, it's 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 a tough one, especially for you. I can imagine. So so how do how do these sort of obviously you've been with a West Ham fan for, for obviously for, from birth, basically. You know, you're in the area, which is lovely. How did the transition? How did the transition start? You know, in terms of playing for the club, obviously you. Um, yeah, you well, like, like a lot of youngsters, uh, um, I started with West Ham sort of probably about 11, 12 years of age. Um, Tuesday and Thursday nights up at Upton Park, um, being taught by the great Ronnie Boyce. Um, you know, at the time, John Lyle, Ron Greenwood, hitting, ball, hitting balls up against the wall, getting sideways on. Um, and, you know, really that continued, uh, you know, until, you know, you get to 14 when you've got to make a decision, really. And uh, obviously, as a, as a youngster, I, I, I obviously I've trained with other clubs as well. I've trained with clubs like Crystal Palace, um, to name but one, and you know, a few others. But you know, there came a time when it got to the age of 14 when you have to sign schoolboy forms. And uh, I remember the great Eddie Bailey um, came along to see my mum and dad and said, right, you've now got to make a decision. And uh, do you want to play for West Ham or not? And I said very much, yes, of course, I do want to play for West Ham. So I signed schoolboy forms um, at the same time as Paul Allen, actually. Oh, wow. um, Paul Allen and myself signed at the same time uh, and uh, it's ironic actually because uh, we're now talking 43 years on and Paul Allen and myself still uh, share an office together so Paul's office is just down the road from mine at the PFA now and uh, we, we actually laughed about it that um, we've actually worked together now sort of pretty much most of our working lives and uh, we had Jeff Pike with us for a while as well yeah. at the PFA so uh, yeah um, but yeah, going back to you know, I start you know, started playing at fourteen, and uh, you know when I signed um, schoolboy forms, and then you graduate through the southeast counties teams. Um, we had um, a very successful uh, youth team at mm-hmm. that particular time. Um, people like Tony Cotty, Alan Dickens, um, who went on to obviously have great careers, you know, at, at the Hammers as well as of course with Paul. Um, fortunate enough in that team to win the to win the FA Youth yeah, Cup. Yeah. And uh, you know, for myself, um, obviously I, I was fortunate enough to make my league debut in 1980 before we actually won the FA Youth Cup. And uh, it's not quite as grand uh, an achievement as Paul's obviously because obviously Paul went and won the FA Cup <laughs> before he won the before he won the FA Youth Cup. But uh, I, I think that the whole point of it was that West Ham as a club was one that you knew that if you were good enough you get an opportunity, you know, if you, yeah. regardless of age. And if you look at, you know, the age groups that, you know, people like myself, Tony, Alan, we were all sort of playing, you know, we all made it first team debuts, 16, 17s, mm. 18s, not, you know, not like these days when it tends to be a little bit later for people mm. to get an opportunity. I think mean, it was very much a case with West Ham with the famous academy. It was very much the structure that you look to build for players to come through that system. And uh, certainly, People like Tony Carr, Mick McGibbon, Ronnie Boyce did a fantastic job in the conveyor belt of players that they've brought for over the years, you know. And if you look at the generations of West Ham players that have come through, people like like the, you know, the Jeff Pikes, the Alan Kirbishleys, Trevors, the sort of, you know, the Joe Coles, the Rios, you know, there's, uh, you know, the list just goes on and on, doesn't it, really, that of players that West Ham have actually developed over the years. And uh, sadly, for a lot of them, have gone on to bigger and better things, you know, unfortunately with the likes of the Rios and the Joes, the Michael Carricks, the, the Glenn Johnsons. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. And it must have been, I mean, obviously you, when, you, when you made your lead debut and uh, it must have been an incredible, an incredible achievement, being a West Ham fan, walking out and just at Upton Park with, you know, I mean, I, I mean, you, you, to be honest, there's, there's, a, there's a handful of people who are, you know, who are West Ham fans who can live that dream. And so, you know, I think that's why fans take to the Academy boys going through, because it's almost like they're living their dream through you. Um, well, it, well, it is, you know, and, and, to, and to be honest, um, I mean, I was, you know, people talk about my league debut. In actual fact, um, I actually made my debut in, in midweek in the week in the, in, in the great Bernabeu Stadium in the uh, Cup Winners' Cup. I came yes. as a sub yes. against Raul Castilla. And uh, it's ironic actually because you you start you start your career at the Bernabeu. I mean, the only way is the only way <laughs> down really, isn't it? I think it'd be fair to say that that was a reflection of perhaps you know how how the, my career panned out. I mean, but you know, you, for me, you know, making that debut on the on the Saturday against Watford yeah. uh, was you know 
it, it was very much something that did fulfill a dream and to actually um, to score on my yeah. debut as well was just incredible and uh, it's it's funny actually because when you look and I talk about you know, my generation I mean TC did exactly the same thing yeah. you know TC made his debut and scored against Spurs I remember that one I think Alan Dickens also made his debut and scored uh, I remember away at Notts County actually but for me you know you know it, it was very much a special memory and remains so now I mean I, I speak to West Ham fans now and uh, I think if every West Ham supporter I've spoken to uh, who claims to have been at that game against Watford in 1980 actually was there I think there, there must have been about 50,000 people there and I, and I don't think there were <laughs> they were I didn't Bobby I'll be honest because I wasn't actually born I do apologize I do, I do. <laughs> I was four eighty one, so I missed out unfortunately. I would have been there probably otherwise. Um, and obviously, you know that that sort of period that he was he was playing for the club for the, for the first team was a really. I mean, there was a load of good characters in there. What was it like being a sort of? I suppose you, with you and there was a group of you, so to speak, who were of similar ages. But going in and you know people like Reg and you know there's, there's lo- there was loads of massive characters coming through that team um, when you was in there. What was it like being in that dressing room? With all those players. Well, I mean, to be honest, it was it it, it was uh, the, the beauty of, of that particular dressing room was the fact that in those days in the Premier League Division One or whatever you want yeah. to call it, there was much more continuity of squads. Yes. You know, you came back every year and the same people would be there. You know, so clubs tended to keep squads together for sort of a lot longer period. I mean, even um, when you know when the team got relegated um, and. Uh, people thought that we'd lose people like Trevor, for example, and yeah. uh, not only did they stay, they stayed and, and came back and won the league, won the cup, uh, you know, if you remember. And, you know, if you think there was that continuity, and for me, growing up, having looked at people like, you know, the great Trevor Brook and Billy Bonds, people like that, they were people that I, I'd idolised, yeah, you know, of course. from afar. And to actually be in the same dressing room and to be on the same pitch as people like that was, was wonderful. And uh, I think that, the beauty of it as well it was a very close knit group yeah um you know we, we all still speak to each other regularly now i mean the boys of 86 thing is obviously a bond but the reality is is that people like like the phil parks is the alan devonshire's you know you know we're all still in regular contact you know mm. tc alan dickens obviously i can't get away from paul you know but uh you know we very much it's very much a case that you know there was that camaraderie between the group that you know, we we grew we grew up together. We trained together. You you shared success. You shared um, you, you shared you shared defeat together. But you know, it, it was very much a case that it was a family club, and yeah. it was a family club that was led from the top by John Lyle, who mm. was very much uh, the father figure for for all of us in the sense yeah. that you know he was so much respected with his staff. People like. Yeah, Mick McGiven, who I still see regularly, Ronnie Boyce, uh, the late Ernie Gregory, you know, it, there was continuity there. And, you know, and, and that, I think, formed a really important part of what uh, this club is all about. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And as you said, you know, the, the continuity, you had sort of, I think it was five players from the 80, 1980 end up going to the 85-86 squad. And, you know, that, and, and when we interviewed Tony, he was, Tony Gay, he was saying you know, every year that he was there was a testimonial year. You know, yeah. for a different player, which is incredible nowadays. You think about it; it's it's a rarity now, as you said. Players move around. There's a lot more fluidity in terms of so that, that's why you don't get that sort of same camaraderie, same team spirit mm-hmm. that you had back in the day, so to speak, because you have players there. There's a real sense of continuity there, and I think, um, and I think that's that's probably a little bit why you know nowadays players, you know, some players fans don't take to as quickly because. You know they're only there for a couple of seasons, then they you know bugger off a little. You know that's, that's the way in nature of football at the moment. Same as managers as well. I think what you find though, to be honest, Russ, as well, is that you know you do get players. I mean Billy, Billy. I mean people forget that Billy, Billy Bonds wasn't a homegrown player. You know no. Billy, but Billy was Billy was actually an ex-Charlton player. But I mean try telling a West Ham fan that as far <laughs> as any West Ham fan would ever tell you, Billy is West Ham. You know, and uh, even some even someone like Gally. I mean Gally wasn't homegrown, but Gally came in and immediately it was as if he'd been there forever. Yeah. You know, he he had that type of personality. He was very outgoing, very much the joker of the pack in the dressing room, and uh, he fit he fitted straight in with the uh, with the West London posse, as it were, because yeah. uh, we had that we had the little group who came across from uh, from the West, uh, people like people like Dev and uh, Paul Goddard and uh, Parksy, you know, and that that lot used to come across from you know from west of the city, if you like, whereas uh, the, the majority of the squad were sort of you know you'd probably say Essex based. 
Mm. Yeah, and I, I get that. Yeah, but it, it just—it was just this melting pot, which just worked, didn't it? It just worked, yeah. you know. It just, and it, as you said, it, it's 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 a, it's a period of time which a lot of fans, you know, look back and with you know with, with great pride because you know you said they it's probably the last time we, we won anything really in terms of 1980. But I've been to Cup in '99. We forget that. Um, uh, but you know, like '85, '86, we still talk so humbly about that and. You know, when I was, I think I was interviewing Tony Cotty and he said there was something like 17 home records that, or 17 yeah. club records that that team still possesses. Oh. Absolutely mental, absolutely crazy. Yeah. Um, right. What we do, Bobby, is us, you know, obviously you play, you mentioned loads of, loads of amazing players. What we like to do with, with the fans and players is to do is Hammers 11. That's the whole idea of the channel, really. Um, but the idea is to go through and, and, and put together a team of, of you know, uh, of people from your perspective, people maybe that you played with. Um, at West Ham now you know obviously you know not saying one's better than the other but the idea is it's just to get a, a feel of, of the people you enjoy playing with because obviously six years 50 odd appearances you know, there's a lot of players in, in that um, in that team um, we try and keep it to a four four two as well just because I'm not particularly good at video editing to be honest <laughs> this isn't my day I, job. I know I'm going to have to be very careful here because I know I'm going to I know I'm going to upset a lot of people of so course you are for, for the record, apologies to everybody in advance. <laughs> you can always do honourable mentions. That's that's how uh, I think that's how Bish got away. But honourable mentions for da 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 da. But I'm going to pick da da. So that's how he did it. So for the, I mean, I could probably guess a lot of these to be honest, Bobby, based on the, the period you played and the players you played with. So in terms of in goal, <laughs> well, that, would to be honest, that's a very easy one. So I mean, I'll start you off easy there, Bobby. That, that's a very easy one, but having said that, um, what I would say is that the only person who, who might well dispute this one will be the late, great Ernie Gregory, who, as, according to Ernie, was the best goalkeeper that ever lived. But uh, Ernie was a wonderful character. He re- really was. He, he was Mr. West Ham, and he, you know, the tales that he used to tell everybody sort of yeah. his time at the club, and how had it not been for the war that he'd have been the, the best goalkeeper ever, you know. But Ernie was Ernie was a great character, and uh, I, I didn't get the opportunity to see him live, but I hear that he was a great goalkeeper. But for me, uh, you, you can't really get anywhere away from Phil. I mean, Phil Parks, for me, I mean, Phil is not just as a, a footballer, but as a person. Phil yeah. Parks is a wonderful person, a great guy. I, I can't speak highly of anyone more than I could of Phil Parks yeah. because he was someone, I, you know, as a youngster coming in, when I came in, he was the world record signing yes. at the time. 565,000, huge amount of money back in the day for a goalkeeper. But he more than justified that because he was immense. He, If ever there was a goalkeeper that controlled his penalty box, it was Phil. He used to actually say to, he used to, actually say to everybody, and he must have been so reassuring to the defenders because he used to just say, if it's in the six-yard box, it's mine. So you better get out of your way because if because I'm coming and I'm coming through whatever, and part of the training re- regime that was devised for him by Ernie Gregory was that um, when crossing practice used to take place for Phil, uh, all the youngsters, all the apprentices would be lined up as cannon fodder in the uh, six yard box, and basically you'd just be there as obstacles and human skittles really for Phil, and basically balls would be lofted into the box. And you did your best to just get out of the way of big Phil as yeah. he came. But, you know, but for a big fella, he was remarkably agile as well. Uh, fancied himself as an outfield player on the, in training games. I'm not, <laughs> not too sure about that. But for me, I think he, Phil was just very unfortunately born in a generation yes. that, you know, with people like the Shiltons, the Clemences, mm-hmm. the Joe Corrigans. But, and undoubtedly, I, I think he'd have amassed many England caps had he not even been, been in such a steam company. But... Yeah, for me, no question at all, Phil Parks. No, lovely Phil. man. Yeah, lovely guy. All right, we'll put Phil in. Let's go Let's go left back then, Bobby. Who do you have left back? Um, there have been so many good left backs yeah. over a period of time. You know, it's uh, it, it's really, that's a very difficult one. I never played with Dixie. I've played against Dixie many times and uh, he kicked me many times for <laughs> various teams when I played against him. And without doubt, I think he encapsulated one of the things that when you when you put West Ham fans into categories, they love the silky skills of the Trevors, the Devs and the Paolos, but at the same time they really appreciate someone like a Billy Bonds or a, yeah. a, a Julian Dix or, you know, who's going to be very up and at them, you know. Yeah. I think um, without without doubt, um, we had several sort of very good left backs at the yes. time. 
you know, you know Frank, you know, you know, obviously Frank Senior played there for a lot, and you, know, you can't ignore you know, the, the amount of appearances he mm. made for West Ham. You know, you know played on the side as well, Frank. To be fair, you know, it's a, Frank. Frank, I think, was a very underrated player. Actually, definitely. You know, I, I know he played. I know. I think he got a couple of caps. You know, but I think he was a far better player in in his prime than you know people gave him credit for. Um, Dixie, I think, was very much one that you'd look at within the nineties, which was probably post myself, if you like. Mm. Um, but I think it's a difficult one. But I think I think in his prime, I think I think I'd probably go for. Um, I think I'd probably go for Frank. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're right. And I think, I think he has, and, and what's come through of this, I think not, not he's become lost in it, but you know, I think, I don't, I think it's, he's been underappreciated. Uh, you know, when you look back and talk to all the, like, I don't know, people who were around during that experienced vans, I call them. Um, Frank comes through really, really, really fondly. And I don't think he's, you know, considering how many games he played for the club, he doesn't seem to be ever in that same bracket. Do you know what I mean? As as Billy people and forget Trevor. though, Russ. People forget that he played. He played in the teams with the great Bobby Moore. And exactly. Talk, you know, the generation. If you look at the generations of teams that, that Frank played in, and yeah. made a wonderful contribution, won two FA Cups. You know, yeah. one, you know. I, I, I think if you look at you know his success, I, I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can ignore Frank. No, not at all. Not at all. Totally get that. All right, put Frank in. Let's let's get the other side then, Bobby. Who's going to be right back? Um. I think that's, um, that's, that's, that's similarly that's a difficult one actually, um, and uh, many people you could mention in dispatches. But for me, probably one of West Ham's best ever signings was uh, was Ray Stewart. Yeah, Tonka. Um, I think Tonka came to us as a 19-year-old from Dundee United. Um, first season played in played and won in an FA Cup final, won a League yeah. Cup. Well, played in a League Cup final, I should say. Um, hundreds of games. Um, very rarely missed some one of the 60 or 70 penalties that I think he successfully converted for us. Um, and a great, a great character, Ray, as well. Very much a, you know, a winner, a fighter. Um, I, I think, again, that Ray is, is another of those that was perhaps underrated mm. in terms of what he contributed and what he, what he gave to the club. You know, he, he was a fierce competitor um, and a, another one, a, a better footballer, I think he was given credit for. So uh, I think I think I think I'd go with Tonka. Yeah, I think you would. Although you wouldn't understand what you were saying anyway. Bless him. But yeah, <laughs> that is good. Scared to not. <laughs> he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. He actually phoned me. Bless him. He phoned him to say he doesn't. He's, he wasn't ignoring me, but he didn't do Zoom. You know, in, in his in his Scottish accent. And uh, yeah, but he, he still you'd have definitely needed subtitles anyway. Know, so. Yeah, exactly. I said we'll do it. We'll do it when we get back to London Stadium. Don't worry. All right, we'll put we'll put Tonka in. Let's go centre half. So who's your first centre half? Then Bobby. Um, first, first one I think is Billy. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I was fortunate enough through most of my time at West Ham to play with two great centre halves. Mm. And uh, as I've said before, and I've said, you know, for me, Billy epitomised everything that West Ham was all about. Yeah, you know, the warrior, the sort of competitor, the captain who would get his hand, get his hand around your throat if you weren't doing it. Um, he, he dragged people along in games and demanded of everybody. I, I, I sometimes think you look for leaders in clubs when things are going badly. And I think Billy epitomised that leader, respected by everybody, um, fans, players, everybody. And I think he was very much the leader. I think the, the best um, description I could give of the leadership qualities and the relationship with Billy was, is that um, we, we played in a charity game a few years ago um, in, with regard to the boys of 86 and uh, we were playing in a friendly game at Chelmsford and I'm strolling along in my usual manner and there was this roar from Billy, Digger, get yourself back in there. And it was like in a time warp, it was like <laughs> I suddenly morphed back into the 17, 18 year old kid in the dressing room and did as I was told and went back oh, and... Yeah. Uh, it was just second nature if Billy said to do it, he did it. Yeah. And so, you know, I think Billy, Billy was very much the leader and, you know, I think his leadership skills, his battling qualities, his, uh, his desire to win certainly for me made him a perfect centre half and captain. I, if I'm making my captain, I've also made him captain of mine. Yeah. yeah, yeah no, by all time 11 at the same time. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, unsurprisingly, Tony Gale made himself captain. <laughs> I'm surprised to Reg, and Reg was on corners, free kicks, 
penalties and he was first team coach and assistant coach as well but that's raging it right? probably the biggest compliment i can play to pay to Gurley actually is the fact that when he came in yeah. to be fair um, billy was coming to the end of his career and, and Gurley came in and what i would say is that although he was a different type of player if you like but he made very much a seamless transition mm. Mm. and fitted into that west ham team along with alvin straight away you yeah. know and the, the biggest compliment I could pay to Gailey is the fact that it's a very hard act to follow is yeah. a Billy Bond. And yet he did that in his own way and he did that very well. And uh, he was very much, Gailey was very much a leader as well in his own way. Yeah. You know, he was yeah. very much someone who brought, brought the dressing room together with his nasty slide dings and things. But that's Gailey. Yes. Uh, that, that, that's, that's, been, uh, that's been picked up on by several ex-players. <laughs> Just took but, it, basically. But that's dressing room, but that's dressing room banter, you know. Exactly. Gally was very much. He was the king. He was the king of that dressing room in that sense. You know, yeah. you had to be very on your toes in terms of what you were, what you wore, and how you <laughs> turned up for training because he had soon have your legs away from you. But uh, but also, you know, for someone with so little pace, he read the game so yeah, well. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, was a top player, and so whilst I sort of I, I am mentioning Gally in honourable dispatches, I'm afraid that. Uh, he doesn't quite make that centre half spot, and I think simply for the reason that I don't think you can go look beyond Alvin Martin. Nah, no, I agree. You yeah, know? no, I agree. He's, a, he's an yeah. incredible player. Al, Alvin for me was you know probably of a different generation in one of the first ball playing centre halves really. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, read the game so well, was fantastic on the ball, um, was a real foil to the more. Um, uh, ball attacking centre halves, if you like, he was the foil to those. Um, very good with his feet. I'm sure. I'm sure he's told you. I'm sure someone else would tell you about the hat trick he scored at Newcastle as well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so it's uh, you know. But yeah, for me, Alvin epitomises, and he's another one that epitomises everything that that is good about West Ham. I mean, it's. I mean, for me, it's just been fantastic to see as well the the next generation now with, yeah. with his with his boy David. You know, we've all seen David grow up as a lot as a young lad and do the hard yards. And you know, mm. for me, it was a, a really fantastic achievement for David to get himself to be part of the club uh, and and fully deserved in terms of the part he yeah. played last year. And, and it was so rewarding as well just to see him sharing that with his dad, yeah. who is a real West Ham legend. So you know, yeah. You know, I was I was at Chelsea at the game when we won at Chelsea and David played and played very well and uh, and I remember afterwards when he ran across to you know to go and you know, greet his dad after the game and it was you know it, it was it was a wonderful moment and mm. something that sort of probably Alvin deserved far far more and probably appreciated far more than anything he did on the pitch. I can't yeah. think of anything better as a West Ham legend as Alvin is than to see your boy on there yeah. as well performing heroics. So yeah, um, that was a you know, magnificent day, I'm sure, for the Martin family. But certainly Alvin was, was responsible for a lot of great days for West Ham because he was, I think he really was an outstanding player. People forget that he was, a, you know, he, he went to, uh, he went to uh, Mexico, I believe, yeah. in, the, uh, in the 86 World Cup, yeah. which is a you know, measure of how highly he was rated and yet had that loyalty that wanted to stay with the club as well. Incredible. You're, yeah, you're right. And, 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 and you know, there's a, there's a few... People out there who I, I'd say you know adopted Cockneys and Alvin's an adopted you know he still lives around the area, you know his his, his grandson goes to my daughter's school, uh, you know so he's, he, you know we're in Orn Church, you know so he's you know yeah. seeing where he came his journey to get to West Ham from you know from 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 sort of Merseyside coming down it yeah. it, it sort of adds adds extra credence to that story as you say in terms of being a I West think Ham we can player. take him as homegrown because he came he did his apprenticeship yeah he, exactly he, yeah he left Everton he did his apprenticeship at West Ham he came through the youth team so you know Alvin definitely to my mind is a homegrown hammer no question yeah. No, definitely. Right, we'll put that. Okay, that's that's the back four and and, and the goalkeeper. Let's go into midfield then, Bobby. Uh, let's go. Um, let's go left midfield. Um, Alan Devonshire. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, yeah, done. <laughs> five five grand from sort from what's name? Yeah, absolutely incredible yeah, sense. That, that that's the easy one. Uh, yeah, I've got I've got to say that had it not, had it not been for the. The, the 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 skills of of an Alan Devonshire, I might play more games, but yeah. you can't ever grasp the fact that he was absolutely outstanding. Came yeah. in came in from non league, um, I think it was Southall he came in for. Yeah. Um, but truly for me, the, one of the most naturally gifted players that West Ham have ever had. 
Mm. Uh, you know, the way he used to glide with the ball. Um, what, what a lot of people forget is not the not just the stuff that he created and the things that you know, the goals that he made, the chances that he made, but the defenders will tell you that when we were under the cosh, and it happened quite a lot at West Ham, you, you do you are under the cosh quite a lot, but just instead of getting the ball and just travelling up to the other the other end of the pitch with it, sort of just running with it and keeping going, then I've relieved the pressure at times when he when he had the ball. And you know, he always aware playing balls in, going into support balls, you know, yeah. For me, it was it was just tragic that the injury he had, I remember the yeah. injury he had at uh, Wigan and ironically that injury opened the door for me to play probably more games that particular season. But you know, with all due respect that you know there was only one Alan Devonshire and uh, yeah. you know, I, I, I really think that he he certainly is one who goes in the all time not not just players that I play, but he's definitely one that's in there in the, the all time Hall of Fame. Yeah, I agree totally, totally, and, and yeah, as you said, you know, I mean, even even you know, in your day now, in your, in your sort of role now, Bobby, you know, five grand for that player, yeah. you know, wow. what would he be worth in today's money? Do you know what I mean? Oh, it's absolutely you, you wouldn't you wouldn't like to think quite. No. I mean, you look at you look at the prices that we play for some players in the current team. Yeah, and you think is Dev as good as those? I think you'd say yes, he yeah. yes he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's go the other, let's go the other side. Let's go right midfield then, Bobby. Um, that's a, a difficult one because there are there are there were so many players who played down that yeah, right hand yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. I, remember, I mean, Paul Allen played out there for a while on the right hand side very successfully actually before Paul obviously went off to Spurs. I think that was probably Paul's best season actually when sure. he played on the right hand side. Yeah, Paul Paul played there very successfully. Um, Mark Ward came in and did a fantastic job in that um, Boys of '86 team in particular. Mm. Yeah, Mark came in. Um, and really made a difference, you know, not just the power of his shooting. I mean, for a, for what you describe as a pint size winger, yeah. if you like, he yeah, yeah, certainly yeah. didn't lack in aggression and desire. And, you know, I, I think Mark would definitely be someone who, you know, made that role his own. I mean, you know, his long range shooting, his, uh, you know, his crossing. Um, I think, I think Mark certainly was, you know, would certainly be considered by most West Ham fans looked at very fondly definitely. in that position. Um, so I think, yeah. If I'm looking through my time there, and obviously I played played I played myself down that side, yeah, uh, yeah, for a while. But I, I would have to say that um, without doubt, Mark 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 Ward, I think, gets my vote. Sure. And, yeah, this is getting perilously, perilously close to a boys of '86 team. If I'm not careful, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be objective. Yeah, well, I think when I interviewed Wardy, he basically just read, read out the '86 team, except for Julian. <laughs> Because he played, because I'd put Julian in, because we would have won the league um, if we had Julian in that team. He reckon, but yeah, all right, yeah, we put Wardy in um, again. Another, another sort of adopted Cockney, really. You know, he's he's still very much revered by the West Ham lot. And um, right, okay, let's go into midfield then, Bobby. Let's go to centre midfield. Who's your first centre midfield player? Um, well, the first, well, the first one, number ten, uh, I think is probably the easiest one of the lot. Yeah, um, but uh, in terms of uh, Memorable mentions for number tens. I don't think you can not talk about Paolo. No. I think you know Paolo came to the club and uh, one of Harry's signings. And uh, I think I think it would be fair to say that nobody knew what we were going to get. No. Uh, but I think in, as a West Ham fan, I certainly look at Paolo and I think that he was um, a real joy to watch. You know, I never had the privilege of playing with Paolo, but you know, as a West Ham fan, someone I Totally enjoyed looking, you know, yeah. watching. I think you know the flair, the, the the histrionics, the tantrums, but but the end product. I mean, you know, you, you look at some of the goals he's got. I mean, there's the, there's the famous volley when he's launched in mid air, sort of, you know, that you know gets shown on every clip special. Yeah, yes. pa- Paolo was a, Paolo was a wonderful player, but you know, but even even as great a player as Paolo was. I think for me, and I think for all West Ham fans, I think there's only one number ten. Mm, you yeah. know, there's only one number one ten, and that's Trev. Yeah. You know, um, Sir Trev. Um, for me, um, I was fortunate enough to play games with Trev, and at that time when I came into the side, Trev was probably in the twilight of his career, mm. but he was still by far, you know, such a class act. He really was a wonderful player, and you know the. The joy of Trevor, the balance, the strength. I mean, Trevor had the Trevor had the lot. 
you know he his balance was so good that he used to play in rubber soles on muddy pitches and you know never lose his balance and uh you know for me um he, he just had, he he really had everything on my league debut people talk about me uh, scoring on my league debut but trev scored the winner you know uh, yeah. that particular that particular day um i think i think he's someone who could have gone and played anywhere and showed great loyalty mm. to the club you know people were, i mean there was rumors at the time that the great brian clough wanted to sign him going back a few years ago um he stayed when the club got relegated he stayed yeah. He was a, you know, he was a, a regular in the international playing in the World Cups, and he stayed, and he saw he saw success through generations, didn't he? You know, yeah, good point. Sixties through seventies, you know, he he played with the greats, with the Moros. He, he came through the generations, and you know, integral part of the team that came back, not only the team that came back to um, the old Division One, but of, of course uh, scored that famous header in the FA Cup final, but. That, that, yeah, you could you could you could carry on talking superlative yeah. about Trev. Um, I can remember actually sitting at, at Wembley. At, we were at a dinner uh, at one of the cup finals at Wembley, and we were sitting uh, on a table with uh, Claudio, Ran Claudio Ranieri and his assistant. And I remember at the time, um, all they wanted to talk to Trevor about was, uh, do you remember the famous goal that he scored for England in Hungary when uh, the ball stuck in the stanchion? Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I think that was. Uh, a mark of the fact of sort of you know how widely he was respected and of course. for me you know as I said you could talk about Trevor all day but for me certainly in the category I, I will put him alongside the Bobby Moores the Billy Bonds you know yeah, I think yeah, Trevor yeah. Brook is Sir Trevor Brook is without doubt one of the greatest icons of uh of this club no i agree he's, he's part of that mount rushmore isn't it of west ham players yeah, definitely absolutely and, uh, and and a great guy as well yeah and a great and a great yeah. guy as well and he and he is not half as sit on the fence that people would have you believe <laughs> when, when you talk to him privately trevor trevor has strong opinions but he's always been so diplomatic to air yeah. them publicly no i get that and what one thing i don't appreciate about 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 your era bobby is 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 how crap how boggy the pitches were do you know what i mean it's only watching all these all these old games again that i realized how the state of these pitches and they said people like yourself and trevor doing all this incredible skill and dev on on bogs you know again what would they what would you guys be like at the the bowling green at london stadium you know it'd been it's been incredible well funnily enough, well, funnily enough i was talking to frank mcavelli about that last week yeah. Because we were talking about the Chelsea game. I don't know if you remember the Chelsea in '86 when yeah, 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 yeah. got two and Frank got one. And we were talking about the pitch then. And you, you look at that pitch at Stamford Bridge there, and it was an absolute quagmire, wasn't it? Yeah. And yet, sort of as you say, the bo the boys, you know, the way they played, and you know, the performances on, on pitches like that. As you say, you know, you do think that with the benefit of uh, modern sports science and better pitches oh, and God, yeah. better nutrition and training. You know, people often ask about you know different eras, and yes, the game is faster now. But I genuinely think that had you put a Trevor Brooking or a Billy Bonds or you know a McAvenny or someone like that into this generation, I think that'd have been equally effective and that'd have been yeah. more protected. Yeah, yeah. I think it was. I think it was Wally said if you put the '86 team up against the current West Ham squad, he reckon they'd have done about four nil. He reckons four five nil. <laughs> So, I, 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 I'm going to be diplomatic and say that yes. you know it's uh, it's very difficult to judge. It's very difficult to judge. It is, is and and you know, yeah, we we can't judge them. It's a generational thing, but yeah, but yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> all right, very diplomatic there, Bobby. Okay, let's um, let's go for that that last piece of the mid, of the midfield pie. Who's your last midfielder? Um, very difficult actually that one because uh, it's it's usually an unsung role, isn't it? Yes. It, it's the role that sort of people fill really so that the likes of the devs and the Trevors can thrive. So it probably doesn't get the glamour, does it? No, I know that, you mean. it's actually due. But, you know, people forget how good a player Alan Kirby was when he first came into the side as well. You know, and, you know, I think Kerbs, I think everybody expected an awful lot from Kerbs and there was an awful lot of pressure on him when he first came in. Another local boy who, you know, fantastic ability, um, Probably a little bit like myself, didn't really fulfil the potential that he had at West Ham. Curves went on to have a fantastic career, uh, not only as a player but also as a manager as well. You know, but but Curves is someone I, I would certainly mention. Um, 
I would certainly mention um, Neil Orr, who, uh, who another adopted Scot who came down and uh, you know was a was an integral part of the jigsaw. Really, did did all the dirty stuff. You know, yeah. did yeah you know, did all the stuff and got the ball and got it for others. And uh, you know, he he played a play, a key role as well in that particular role. Uh, for me, I think if if we're looking, I I don't think you'd go far further than Jeff Pike. Yeah. Uh, for me, Jeff Pike gets that final spot for me uh, because I, you know, in terms of the players that I was fortunate enough to play with, Jeff was very much one of those as well that was an unsung hero. True. Did that, did that, did the dirty work, covered a lot of ground, was a much better one-touch footballer than he was ever given credit for. Jeff, you know, he really was. You know, he was very much give and go. You know, linked play sort of. You know, so I think he's someone who never really got the credit that he got. That, and pro- that he that he deserved uh, was an integral part of, as I said, giving the freedom to those more flair players, if you like, yeah. to go on and create, and you know, created a fair few things himself as well, mm-hmm. Jeff. So you know, I, I think he's another one of those unsung heroes who perhaps doesn't get the credit that he's due. So yeah, I think I think I I will be inclined to think, well, yeah. Jeff, yeah. Jeff makes my team, and and again one of those one of those few who did both. He did the eighty and the eighty five, eighty six. You know, I think it's yeah, five. Absolutely. Um, and again, yeah, doesn't doesn't necessarily get got the credit that he, he deserves. I totally get that. And he says that himself. Yeah, <laughs> he, I'm he sure says he, I'm sure, I'm he, would sure he did. He did, <laughs> didn't Pikey? Right. Okay. Let's go up front then. Um, strikers. First striker then, Bobby. Um, that is probably the hardest of the lot. Yeah. And uh, there are so many. Great of, of my generation, there are yes. so many to talk about that I'm going to I'm going to upset far more here than I'm not going to than, I'm, than I'm not going to upset. Um, I think I think if I if I were to talk about those under consideration, <laughs> David Cross, yeah, David Cross was one of my absolute heroes because an intelligent guy, David. Uh, if, to see him on the pitch, you wouldn't believe the character, the, the intelligent, well spoken erudite character he is off the yeah. field I, I learned so much from David Cross not just in the football sense but a, as a person sure um, wonderful striker for West Ham never forget the the season when we when we the first season when we came up and he scored four at, at um, White Hart Lane yeah. uh, when we when we beat Spurs you know he regularly scored sort of you know double figures 20 goals in the time that he was at West Ham um, very much led the line, William Runner, um, very much someone who was was able to handle the physical side of it. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, you know, for me, David Cross is definitely one that, you know, you, you, you can't fail to mention in dispatches. Um, Stuart Pearson. Yes. I mean, Stuart, Stuart Pearson came to us at the back end of a wonderful career. And he was, he was someone who was one of my heroes, Stuart, mm-hmm. you know, he was part of that wonderful Manchester United team of the early 70s when you had people like um, Gordon Hill and Steve Coppel crossing balls, you know, for him and Joe Jordan, you know. And then when he actually turned up at our training ground and sort of, uh, uh, and you thought, wow, I'm going to play with Stuart Pearson. For me, he was an absolute legend. And probably yeah. probably one of the highlights of my career is the fact that I shared a room with uh, Stuart wow. Pearson. Oh. And, because he really was a legend and such a clever footballer as well. Yeah. Um, he was the he was he was one of those players who could link play, drop back, play in the hole. I mean, in, in the cup final, if you remember, you know, tactical genius from John Lowell, the way that the position that Stuart played in the in the cup final against Arsenal, where he played in that more withdrawn left side role, you know, and absolutely perplexed Arsenal. Couldn't they figure out, no, no, no. They, they just couldn't figure out what to do with him. So he was someone who had a real, you know, a real talent. Um, I think he was a wonderful player as well. Um, there again, I think though, but going back to my you know, my boys of eighty sixteen, I think if you look at the two boys who played yeah. up front, apologies to all to all other strikers, but if you're talking about what, you know, and of course you can't ever have a conversation about West Ham strikers without mentioning Sir Jeff Hurst. You know, yeah. you you can't. How, how can you leave Sir Jeff Hurst out of any West Ham team? You know, because he, you know what he achieved, you know, not just, not just for, for West Ham, but obviously for, for his country as well. You know, for me, Jeff Hurst is one of the greatest mm. West Ham strikers of all time. Um, 
I'm going to try and cheat on this one because I'm going to name four and I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to try not to, to, to break them down. No worry. Um, <laughs> TC, yeah. you can't get away from, you can't get away from TC just because of his goal scoring record. I mean, TC was from the, from day one. Yeah. I mean, when he made his debut against Spurs, I remember sitting and saying, we all knew he was going to score quite honestly. It, it, it wasn't a case of, is Tony going to score? Yeah. Tony scored goals, you know, in the youth team, in the reserve teams, Tony was such a driven, single-minded goal scorer. I, I never forget, even in his autobiography, he has a pop at me for not passing to him in a reserve game where <laughs> sort of, he might have scored another one. You know, but but he was Tony was a great clinical finisher. You know, that's that's what Tony did, and yeah. I mean, his record speaks for itself, doesn't it? You know, in terms of you know, and you know, not not just you know, he went off to Everton and scored goals as well. You know. Played, played for his country, you know, T- TC, a mad, a proper West Ham fan, Tony, yeah. sort of, you know, went to, went to school around the training ground and, you know, you speak to his mum, his mum's a West Ham fan and he's just everything, you know, Tony is very much, you know, it, it epitomises West Ham. Yes. A, a great, a great friend, you know, a great yeah. guy. And for me, I've, I've got to pick Tony because if I didn't, he'd never talk to me again. <laughs> get the ump, so, wouldn't he? He'd get the ump. Yeah. So, he um, loves a stat, does Tony? Yeah, he likes to keep his stats up. Yeah. So yeah, you can't get past Tony. His record, I think, his record is second to none. So yeah. without doubt, Tony Carty, uh, he he's in that he's in that four that I'm actually putting forward. Okay. Uh, num- number four actually came to us as a midfield player. And uh, it was only through injuries that he was actually pushed up front. And uh, when he was pushed up front, you look at what he did. And I'm talking about Frank McAvenny. Yeah. Great yeah. guy, Frank. Speak to him regularly. In fact, I spoke to him last week. Um, He's you, great. You can't help you can't help but smile when you hear no. when, I, when I see Frank's number come up on the phone <laughs> and, and I pick up the phone and I, and I just have a little smile on my face because I love yeah. Frank. You know, he's... Uh, He's just the old, he's the ultimate teenager, Frank. You know, yeah. Frank, Frank, Frank's in a time war. He's still 16, Frank. You know, and I love him. He, he had that joy about him, the way that he played. That, and people looked at Frank and they, they said, yeah, he's a party animal. He's this, he's that. But no one ever trained harder. No, no, no. one no. ever worked harder on a football pitch. And no one had more of a desire to win and to score goals and to, you know, and in that particular season, him and TC were electric. Yeah. You know, that, they were as good as anything. And, uh, you know, when I talk about TC, I mean, TC was very much a box player, Tony. Yeah. You know, that's, that's where he came to life. Frank wanted to be part of the party. Frank wanted to play and sort of, you know, he, Frank could use up a lot of energy going here, there, everywhere, but, but he could score goals. And, you know, he, he was a clever player, Frank. He far better player than people gave him credit for. And, I do, I do genuinely think as well that he was very unfortunate because his peak time, if you like, when he scored the goals for us was unfortunately during a time when we didn't have a TV deal and we had a TV blackout. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of a lot of the goals that Frank That's scored, a good point. Yeah, yeah. You know, weren't seen by the wider public, and I, I remember once in an effort to uh, change that. Um, funnily enough, I've just got to tell you now, my phone's just rung and it's uh, it's Paul Allen. So I'm <laughs> I shall, uh, I shall put, speak to Paul when we finish this uh, this call. Don't worry, I'll be emailing him later anyway. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, Frank McAvenny, you know, I remember I remember his appearance on Wogan, and yeah. uh, you know he, he he was one of these guys, Frank. That uh, never mind that he played hard, he worked hard, everything he did, you know, loved Frank. He you know he loved life, still loves life. Yeah, and you know I, I think he is a true West Ham adopted legend as well you know i think probably the funniest story about frank is that um when he when he did his autobiography um he decided to do it at string fellows uh, he decided to do the launch at string fellows so he persuaded a few of us to come along and i'm thinking i really don't want to be seen in string fellows on a whatever yeah. night it was and so we went along to we went along to the launch and at that particular time um Frank hadn't told us, but it was being the, the book launch was being televised by Soccer AM. And I thought to myself, I am not going to be seen <laughs> in string fellows at a book launch or anything on any night of the week. And I remember after they'd done the filming, I actually I remember ringing up the producers of uh, Soccer AM and saying, Could you cut me out of the <laughs> could, we, could you cut me out of that, please? I, like, I don't want to be in that particular uh, segment, but uh, no. 
but no, he's Frank. Frank's a great, a great guy. Yes, yeah, so he's another one I speak to regularly, and uh, he, he's he's one of those who fully deserves to be part of that part of that um, esteemed selection of great strikers at West Ham. Yeah. So I say those those are the four that I'll talk about. There, there are many more that you could talk about. Of course, about there's and, hundreds. And I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to try and split them to be honest. Nah, no, nah, I get that. Don't worry, don't worry. But man, it's been it's been brilliant. I know you're a busy man, and I'm, I'm taking you away from your calls from Paul Allen and everything. It's been lovely chatting to you. January. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you very, very much for your time, Bobby. Uh, yeah. And obviously, everyone watching at home will, will appreciate that as well. You know, lots of great memories and. Um, and from me and Bobby, thanks for watching. You know, share, like, subscribe. You know what to do. Um, keep the messages coming in. I read everyone really humbled by all the support for the channel. And for me and Bobby, um, take care, everyone. Stay safe. And we'll see you very, very soon. See you, guys. Thanks very much. Cheers, Russ. Cheers. Cheers.